So welcome back once again to another session of MIT. And uh, in this, we will be talking about the various study designs. And I welcome Dr. Kiran Chaudhary. She is head of the Department of Transfusion Medicine. And she has a vast experience in uh, as a researcher and as a biostatistician. And uh, I, I believe that she's going to do a full justice to the topic. And we are going to enjoy her talk. So along with her, we have few participants. Dr. Nitin Chaudhary, she, he is an assistant professor in the Department of Anesthesia and Dr. Priyanka, from assistant professor from Department of Anesthesia. We also have Dr. Nitin Agarwal, who has been a constant support to MIT. We, I welcome all of you and ma'am, I hand over to you to start with your talk, please. Thank you, Ajal, for your introduction. And I also thank the MED division to provide this opportunity to me to give this uh, presentation on study designs. <clears throat> now, before I begin, I would like to acknowledge two people in my life. One is Dr. Edward L. Murphy and Dr. Willie McFarland, from whom I learned research methods. And uh, this created a lot of interest in me. And uh, then I pursued further and I learned a lot about research methods over time. And I'm, I'm also using the slides which they had provided when I was their student. So you people must be ready with the research question. And the research question has the characteristics of finer. So what are these characteristics? F stands for feasible, I for interesting, N for novel, E for ethical, and R for relevant. Now, what I suggest that before I start study designs, if you have these finer characteristics in your research question, you still should be open to modify it. Because if it is not ethical, certainly it is not going to be a very good thing to do as a researcher. So you must be mentally prepared to refine it and then choose your study design. So basically, I'm telling you about the hierarchy of the study types. We have two types of studies. One is a descriptive study and the other is an analytic study. Uh, within the analytic study, we have two groups, observation studies, experimental studies. Now, I will be now dealing with each of these designs one by one. So to begin with the descriptive studies, uh, I will be um, telling you about case reports and case series. So at the end of this uh, slide, below uh, the slide, you see a white line. And this white arrow, it goes towards the right of your screen. And what does this indicate? As we proceed through the study designs, what you will see is the strength of evidence for causality between the risk factor and the outcome increases as we move towards the right of your screen. So the randomized control trial provides the highest level of causality between the risk factor or the exposure and the outcome. So what is a case report? In your clinic or practice, you see an unusual case and you feel that uh, you have never seen such a case before. So this one new case also can be published and reported. And this becomes a case report. Next is case series. So several such new cases you are seeing in your practice, in your clinics, and they could be linked to each other. Now, reporting case series helps us to generate a new hypothesis. But the disadvantage is that there is no comparison or control group in this. So here, if I diagrammatically show you how a case series looks like, uh, the perpendicular white line shows where the researcher is standing. The researcher is placed in uh, time and he sees a few cases in his clinic over a short period of time uh, in the previous uh, weeks or months. And then he decides that he should collect data on it and document it. So this is a very good example where uh, in Los Angeles, 26 homosexual men who were in their 30s uh, came to uh, the clinic with Kaposi's sarcoma. This was the year 1981. And you'll be surprised to know that this was the discovery. This led to the discovery of AIDS. Now, what are the advantages and disadvantages of case series? Uh, you are the first one to describe rare and new disease. And it helps to generate a hypothesis on the causes. And of course, it is low-cost study. The disadvantage is that there is weak evidence of causation. 
and there is a no control group as i had told you previously now i move on to the observational studies now why are they called observational studies because the researcher is only observing and not intervening actively so the researcher has no control over the exposure of the subjects like as you have in randomized control trials so when a randomized control trial is planned and you see that it would not be an ethical or a feasible study then you always would want to do something um, of an observational type of a study so what we do is that we record the exposure and outcome only by observation not by actively intervening and there are two terms which people should be familiar with one is retrospective and the other is prospective so when you look backwards in time then it is a retrospective study when you look forwards in time it is a prospective study but it provides a weaker proof of for causality uh, when compared to a random but usually it is less expensive and you know this is the most common design the observational studies are the most commonly designs published studies and yes as i told you earlier it is publishable also so uh, we have three types of observational studies uh, cross sectional studies the exposure and disease are examined at one point of time in cohort studies one or more groups which are defined by exposure exposure i have highlighted this they are defined by exposure they are followed over time for the disease to develop or the outcome to happen in case control studies we have two or more groups i have highlighted defined by disease and you go back in time retrospectively and you find out about the exposure so we will start with cross sectional studies this helps to measure the prevalence of disease or the risk factors in a population at one point in time so you go to the population you enroll subjects you can conduct screening tests you can have interviews with them for a short period of time now this is very important that it does not become prospective if it takes a bit long for you to enroll all the subjects and collect the data it still remains a cross sectional study and what does a cross sectional do study do it measures the association between having the risk factor and having the disease now this is a diagrammatic representation where you see the population in a circle in the population there are diseased people there are non diseased people you want to measure the risk factor or exposure so you as a researcher go and you take a snapshot so cross sectional studies are called snapshot studies or prevalence studies now this explains it very well the researcher is standing at the white perpendicular line and he goes and he collects data and what does he find he finds this combination x is disease so he has participants with disease with the risk factor with disease without the risk factor and sometimes there is no disease and no risk factor so you come back with this data and this is an ideal cross sectional study so what are the advantages uh, it is a representative study for the risk factors or for the uh, diseases in a population and it provides you with prevalence data you can study multiple diseases you can study multiple risk and you have more control over the measurements than a case control study which i'll be dealing with later where you have to depend on the uh, patient's uh, uh, patient's memory or you have to depend upon uh, the records here you are actually uh, yourself taking the data measuring the data so uh, it is not feasible for rare diseases why because supposing you go into a locality and you are looking for patients of lung cancer you may not even find one or you may just find one or two so it's not good for rare diseases and it gives us a weak evidence for causation because the cause has not come before the effect i can explain this with another example where uh, say a hormone x is uh, found to be associated with acne you go into the population you measure the levels of hormone x and you see the, you um, your participants are patients of acne and then here you cannot prove whether the hormone levels high hormone levels are causing acne or acne has caused high hormone levels so therefore here you cannot establish the cause 
whether the cause has happened before the effect or the disease. Now, this is an example of a cross-sectional study, uh, the health evaluation of the young man or the hay man study. Uh, a survey of men in randomly sampled blocks in poor neighborhoods of California was conducted. And blood was tested for C, so many diseases, HIV, HBV, HCV, syphilis. Along with it, urine was tested for gonorrhea, chlamydia. And they had also applied this questionnaire on risk behavior. So we have done so many things in one cross-sectional study. Now, you can also do serial cross-sectional studies. This is for studying the trends. Uh, so when you do repeated cross-sectional studies in the same population, um, and it can be done annually, it can be done uh, monthly, depending upon the objective of your study. Uh, but they may not be the same individuals. You know, you can do it serious, serially in the same population. Measure the trends in disease or risk factors over time. So what does this do? This shows us the trend of disease. Is it increasing? Is it decreasing over a period of time? And you also know the sequence of events by doing serial cross-sectional studies. This is very common in surveillance and blood banking reports. So this example shows us that we have studied this population. There, are, there is two groups. One is of anonymous testers and the other is of the STI clinic attenders. 96, 97, 98, and 99. And what do we see? That the incidence rates of HIV among these two is rising over this period, showing us the trends. Now, what are case control studies? Case control studies are studies where you start with the disease. So the diseases, diseased participants are your cases. And you, as a researcher, choose your controls. And the controls are those who are without the disease. And then you go back in time and you compare the prevalence of risk factor in the cases, whereas versus the controls. Now, the hallmark is you know the disease outcome status at the time you select your study subjects and before you know the exposure status. So you have to always remember that you have to start with the disease or the outcome and go back and see the exposure. So this is a case control study represented diagrammatically. You have one group of cases. You have the other group of controls. You are going backwards in time retrospectively to measure the risk factor or exposure in both the groups. The researcher is standing at the white longitudinal line, and he has two groups. X is those who are diseased, and O is those who are not diseased. He go back, goes back in time. And then he looks for the exposure or the risk factors. Now, the problem with this is that you have to collect data from records or from patients' recall. And therefore, you have a recall bias. Now, this is an example of a case control study where there were two groups, um, two groups of uh, partners or couples uh, in which in one group, HIV transmission had occurred from one partner to the other. And in the other group, only one partner was HIV positive and the other was negative. So what we thought was the risk factor here was whether the partner or the HIV positive patient was on heart treatment or not. And then you make you what was found finally is that those on heart treatment did not transmit the virus to the partners. Now, what are the advantages and disadvantages of case control studies? So you do this study, especially when you have to characterize rare diseases. Uh, it involves lower cost. It can also be used for outbreak studies. Uh, the disadvantage are, disadvantages are bias in the choice of controls. Many times you don't find controls. You, know, you may use relatives at controls, which is not a very good thing to do. Uh, and then there are challenges in matching. So, since the researcher has to select the controls, now he has to match with a lot of caution. Generally, you match for age and sex, but the researcher should sit down and actually note down all other uh, um, factors or variables that could confound the study and try to match them here. 
there is bias in accuracy of data recall bias as i told you earlier we all know that even if we are asked to um, uh, document our um, history of taking uh, coffee or tea in the past one week per day we will not be able to do it with accuracy and therefore uh, there is weak evidence of causation then we move on to the cohort studies so co prospective cohort studies uh, are which are do, uh, longitudinal studies followed prospectively over time uh, you recruit subjects without disease at the baseline so this is a very very important thing which we all have to understand and then you measure the risk factors or exposures at the baseline you do not control for exposures but you know them and you deliberately choose your subjects by exposure and why this is so because this is an observational study the researcher is only observing you know so he knows about that and he makes his two cohorts or groups depending upon whether the risk factor was present or not but he does nothing and he just observes and he follows up the subjects over time retests for the disease and then he associates the risk factors at the baseline with the later acquisition of disease this is a diagrammatic representation prospective and retrospective cohorts work on the same principle so you start from the risk factors and you move on to the outcomes here you have two groups one is exposed to the risk factor one is not exposed you followed up over time and then finally you measured for the disease or the outcomes now here the researcher is at the first longitudinal line he is recruiting uh, his participants based on the risk factors and not on the disease so it's very clearly shown here zero depicts disease so none of them have the disease and they have they have they are being selected on the basis of whether they have the risk factor or they do not have the risk factor they are all followed up over time prospectively and then at the end the uh, the disease status or the expo uh, or the outcome status is recorded so what are the advantages this gives us a high level of evidence for causality because here we can show that the cause has come before effect and it is a direct measure of the disease incidence so for incidence studies we use the cohort study design uh, the disadvantages are it is expensive time consuming a bit complicated and not feasible for rare disease because at the end of the day you may not find any outcome at all if it is that rare and here the most important bias is bias in loss to follow up bias in participation also supposing you are giving one group yoga classes for half an hour and studying what happens to the hypertension the other group is not having yoga classes now what happens is some of them may not be doing yoga um, for the, for that half an hour or daily or or whatever your uh, uh, protocol says so therefore there is a bias in participation also now this is an example of two cohorts um the blue one shows that uh, they are, they have high risk behavior so behavior change was taught to this group or uh, they were given behavior change education and the other group had been given vaccine now what we see is at the same time they were enrolled same place same population same eligibility same institution but the exposures were different and you are just observing and after a period of time what do you see that the hiv incidence among those who were given behavior change education was less than those who were given vaccines now what is a retrospective cohort study you have to use existing records and specimens saved from another cohort study or another ongoing follow up of patients so here we study the existing records so we have almost no control over the data collection we have to depend on whatever data is available in the records these are longitudinal studies but all events have occurred in the past so be very careful the exposure has occurred in the past and the outcome has also occurred in the past when you start doing the when the researcher starts the research the researcher is at this longitudinal line white line and he he knows that the outcome has occurred in a few of them he goes back in time he looks up the records for the risk factors for those who are exposed and for those who are not exposed and he comes back again to check whether 
those with risk factors have the disease or not those without risk factors have the disease or not so you can see that this arrow is pointed both ways so you go retrospectively into the past you check the historical records but you are actually starting the study from the exposure to the outcome only and hence it is a cohort study which is done retrospectively with historical records so advantages are it is low, co low cost it can be done very fast uh, it is suitable for repeat blood donor panels uh, you have less control over the subjects uh, or the participants and you have less control over the measures because you have to depend upon what has been recorded earlier and the analysis is also slightly complex now if you are lucky you will be able to do a very good retrospective cohort studies if you have all the documents with you or all the blood samples preserved in the way you wanted it to be so this is an example where you are studying two groups um, of gay, gay men who inject drugs and the other is heterosexual men who inject drugs and you think that there is going to be a difference in this so you go back in time you um, see the records or you have the blood samples preserved and you look for incidents among these two groups and then what do you find that gay men who inject drugs the incidence is higher than heterosexual men who inject drugs <clears throat> so now choice of observational study design so we i start from the uh, lowest to the highest so i start with case series when you have discovered something new and you want to publish it first and fast then you choose case series uh, when the disease is rare, your most um, easy choice would be case control studies. When you want the prevalence of many diseases and many risk factors in one population, you do a cross-sectional study or survey. When you are lucky, you have the right population and you have access to good records, you do a retrospective cohort. When you are rich and you have the highest level of scientific evidence, you want the highest level of evidence except RCT, then you choose a prospective cohort study. After this, I move on to the analytic study. So analytic studies attempt to establish a causal link between predictor or the risk factor and an outcome of the disease. Before this, what were we doing for all the three types of studies? We were just looking at associations. Here we want to establish a causal link. Now you are doing an analytic study. If in your research question, you have these words, greater than, less than, causes, leads to compared with more likely than associated with related to similar to or correlated with, which clearly tells you that there are at least two groups and you are trying to see which group is better than the other so now what distinguishes the observational study from the analytical or experimental study your ability to control for confounding it is very very important and what is a confounder so now this is a confounder it is a variable and you have a predictor or a risk factor and an outcome or a disease so this confounder is associated with both the predictor and the outcome In, here we can take the example of smoking as a confounder coffee drinking and pancreatic cancer as the outcome and the predictor predictor is coffee drinking pancreatic cancer is the outcome so what we what the hypothesis is or what some studies showed that coffee drinking is associated with pancreatic cancer whereas this was not true it was actually the confounder smoking due to which this result was coming and it was a spurious result so since those who smoke also drink more coffee it was thought that coffee drinking caused pancreatic cancer so hence smoking here is a confounder so in randomized control trials or analytical or experimental studies, the investigator controls the predictor variable or the exposure or the intervention. And this is the main focus of the whole study that the researcher is being able to control the exposure. Now, the major advantage over observational study is to the ability to demonstrate causality as i told you earlier we were just looking for at associations and not a causal relationship randomization 
controls for the unmeasured confounding so now the some confounding uh, variables you know at the start of the study you should sit down and you should document all and uh, you should know what all are confounding but there are some colors which you cannot measure so by randomization as in the name suggests randomized control trial you are actually controlling for this confounding and this study design is only good for mature research questions so what do you do you have a study population at the baseline and then you randomize them into two groups in one group you give the placebo in the other group you give the intervention you follow them over a period of time and then you measure for the disease or outcome so there are two guiding principles you have to ask an important question so if you can ask an important question uh, then i think you should go and you get a reliable answer then you should go in for uh, randomized control trial design so is there really uncertainty about the best treatment or procedure will the trial results change the clinical practice if you are not able to answer these two then there will be a lot of ethical issues and this design will not be the best design and similarly you will have to have to give a reliable answer and adequate sample size so is it feasible to have that much uh, of population that much sample size or uh, can you see to it that the protocol is adhered to strictly so you have to maximize the follow up and adherence to protocol if you cannot do that also then this is not the best design for you now i will quick go through the steps in a randomized control trial so first you select the participants uh, and it should be for a high risk disease say for uh, um, hiv patients so you should have uh, that in uh, the hiv patients or that risk factor in your population um, and your participants are likely to benefit and not be harmed and they are likely to adhere to the protocol then you measure the baseline variables you randomize you eliminate the baseline confounding by randomization so you use a random number table and um, you uh, there are different types simple stratified block randomization etc and you randomize the patients so how do you um, how does uh, it help to eliminate the confounding now the unknown confounders by randomization are equally distributed in both the arms in your uh, study arm and in the control arm then blinding is also very important it is as important as randomization because it eliminates co intervention now if the patient does not know that he is in the uh, intervention arm uh, and if the researcher does not know that he is in the intervention arm so it is less likely that they will um, do things you know intervene in other ways so that the results go in their favor so sometimes uh, generally driven by commercial interest some people mm, they try to intervene in such ways and the results are biased so biased outcome ascertainments and biased measurement of outcome so the person who is measuring the outcome also should be blinded and person who is uh, uh, the the participant is blinded the researcher is blinded and the person who does the data analysis also can be blinded so you can blind at different levels depending upon the objectives of your study then you follow the subjects for adherence to protocol and for loss to follow up and then you have to measure the outcomes the in addition to the clinically important measures you have to also record the adverse events in a randomized controlled trial now just because a predictor variable is statistically associated with an outcome does it mean that it causes the outcome there are four possibilities either it is causal either the results have come out uh, favoring you by chance uh, or some bias or error has been introduced or there could be confounding so many wrong public health or clinical decisions can be made if the relationship is not causal so proof of causality is difficult especially in observational studies with this i like to summarize in two points that no study is perfect each has its potential biases and limitations 
and no study design is right or wrong for a research question each has its appropriate place thank you thank you so much ma'am you can stop the sharing uh, uh, of the slides and it was a wonderful lecture ma'am it's so simple i am 100% sure that all the pgs will be able to understand and they will be able to do further justice in their uh, future research uh, whatever they plan for so uh, now i would ask our participants dr nitin and dr priyanka if they have any questions to ask hello yeah dr hemi ma'am yes can hear you yeah a wonderful presentation ma'am very uh, simple and yet very informative thank you so much i'm sure it's going to benefit all the people who ever will go through this uh, presentation uh, ma'am i have a one i have one question regarding uh, your presentation uh, can you just uh, throw some light on the difference between a confounder and an effect modifier yes so i'll try to explain that you see as i told you the confounder sometimes can be accounted for sometimes you do not know what it is and it it is actually associated with both the exposure and outcome okay and then they are uh, bound to give us spurious results so before we start a research we should know what a confounder is and we should document it and we should have a list ready so that at the time of analysis we have the data for the con confounders and it can be treated differently now actually if i uh, use a layman's language uh, it's an it's of nuisance value and it we we don't want it as researchers you know it's going to affect your um, affect your study uh, it may affect it in a positive way it may affect it in a negative way but the researcher does not want a confounder there you know so it is actually creating a lot of noise and we do not want it there and there are several methods um especially you know mm -hmm. when you are designing the study and if you think smoking is a confounder you may uh, not have people who smoke but then finally the generalizability of the result becomes very limited so your results will be valid only for those who smoke or who do not smoke if you have not taken one of them into your study so uh, actually the best thing is to document them uh, to collect data on them and at the level of analysis either stratify or uh, you can uh, do a regression analysis and you can find out uh, whether that uh, confounder is actually harming your study or not now as far as effect modifier goes effect modifier is associated with the outcome uh, and effect modifier actually acts as a catalyst and it enhances your study in a way so what happens is supposing if i take an example of uh, use of ocd oc oral contraceptive drugs uh, um, and and i say ocd causes breast cancer but if the female or if if that participant is genetically prone to develop breast cancer the use of ocd actually acts as a catalyst and it increases the risk of breast cancer so these are the differences between effect modification and confounding i Thank hope that clear it Yeah, yeah, thank you so much, ma'am. Okay. Any other questions, Dr. Priyanka? You want to ask something? Please unmute yourself, Dr. Priyanka. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening. Uh, can you please explain what is the difference between a case control design and a retrospective uh, cohort study as both are retrospective yes, yes. so uh, a case control study as i said uh, the mantra is that you begin with the disease okay whereas in a retrospective study you begin with the exposure and uh, you remember i showed you that slide where uh, i showed you that the arrow is pointed both ways so you actually start your study you start your study after the uh, expo outcome has occurred but you go back in time and you start your study from a point in time where you as a researcher make two groups of those exposed and those not exposed you move forward in time after that 
till you reach reach the outcome so in a way you go back in time to get the historical records but actually you are following them over prospectively only even in a retrospective study whereas in a cross uh, in a case control study you start with the cases the researcher will actually then choose the controls generally it is one to one or it can be up to one to four and he moves backward in time and he collects the data you see the data may be there but he will then collect samples or he will um, uh, 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 apply some questionnaires or he will um, uh, look for other um, history and he actually collects the data and he goes retrospectively and then he sees whether the risk can be associated with the disease or outcome so these are the basic differences is it okay yes ma'am thank you ma'am very nice thank here. you you're welcome okay so good evening everyone and uh, continuing in the series of uh, lectures on the basic research methodology which is being conducted by the met division of abvi ms and dr rml hospital uh, today uh, we will be discussing randomized controlled trials and a little bit of information on systematic reviews and meta analysis but mainly concentrating on the randomized controlled trials and to speak on this topic i have a very eminent person dr jay shankar koshik he is a professor department of pediatrics in pgims rohtak he is dm pediatric neurology and he is also author of one of the books which he has written just now and it's just been released uh, uh, so i think uh, uh, without wasting much time i should go on to dr jay shankar koshik and uh, dr jay shankar koshik uh, uh, am i audible Uh, yes dr nitin thank you okay so i think uh, dr jay shankar koshik can start uh, can you enable share screening Can you see my slides, Doctor Nitin? Yes, it's visible. Okay, I'm audible. Well, yes, you are very well audible. Okay, thank you, Doctor Nitin, and uh, thank you, MET Division of Paramal Hospital. It's a proud privilege that I have been given an opportunity to speak on. a uh, basic understanding of randomized control trial and i am very thankful for this opportunity so i still feel that i am also learning how to conduct R rct and every time we keep conducting rcts and we keep giving rcts as thesis to the students we keep learning our own mistakes and we keep Uh, improving over a period of the time so rather i am more of a learner rather than a teacher so i have tried to assemble what i have gathered till now on randomized control trial so the main objective of this session will be to provide an overview on the principles basic principles of rct and to understand the methodology of randomized control trial and to briefly understand the terms called meta analysis and systematic review frankly speaking i don't want to cover too much or go into depth into meta analysis and systematic review the basic purpose will be to understand the basic principles of rct the main thing that we need to understand when we are talking about any randomized control trial is or for that matter interventional studies interventional studies or experimental study designs are those study designs where the researcher is going to intervene at some point of the time throughout the entire study so the first and foremost concept we need to understand is that if the researcher is going to intervene at the study design then this is an interventional study and not an observation observational study so the goal of the interventional study is to test the efficacy of a specific treatment or some kind of a preventive measures per se so the main thing that differentiates an interventional study from an observational study is that the researcher is going to intervene or is going to uh, perform some kind of an intervention so that the outcome or the end point of the study is going to change so the first question that comes to our mind 
mind whenever we encounter any kind of a study design is that are you going to change the outcome of the study yes if you are going to change the outcome of the study then this is called as an interventional study and if you are not going to change the outcome of the study this is a simple observational study so broadly speaking the interventional studies can be divided into multiple ways by which interventional studies can be designed but one of the most common ways by which we tend to classify is one is called as pre post design for example uh, you know if you are going to see a parameter called death or the mortality before and you do an intervention in which you are asking the people to wear a seat belt and then you are seeing after that intervention you are going to see that mortality how much is happening so that means outcome before an intervention happens and then the outcome after so this is what is called as a pre post design many people get confused with pre post design remember that it is not the same study participant right at the same point of the time that is going to determine the pre post design pre post design basically means that an intervention is given at, at the middle of the time you are measuring the outcome before giving intervention you are measuring the outcome after giving the intervention the second very common study design which we generally tend to encounter in interventional studies is quasi experimental study design now quasi experimental study designs are usually used when true experiment is not ethical or practical for example if there are some uh, conditions in which there is a depression and you want to do some kind of a psychological treatment your institutional ethical committee says that no no you can't do this kind of interventional study it does not look ethical then you go back and start thinking that yes a uh, few of my consultants give this psychotherapy and few of my consultants do not give this psychotherapy so that means let me see the outcome of those people who have given that psychotherapy and those people who have not given the psychotherapy so that means the population is not you know very clearly randomized that means the population in which you are going to do the intervention is not a very homogeneous kind of a population but still you are able to get a fair idea provided the population which is coming to this consultant and to this consultant is almost nearly the same so most of the time we tend to use this kind of a quasi experimental interventional study when it is either not ethical or when it is not practical so frankly speaking they are not a kind of randomized control trial or non randomized control trials because we are not randomizing per se so the other two important uh, uh study designs interventional study designs are randomized control trials and non randomized control trial now we commonly use the term called non randomized control trial when especially the intervention is being compared to no intervention group so if this is happening we usually uh, tend to use the term called non randomized control trial so broadly speaking the interventional studies can be divided into pre post design studies they can be divided into randomized control trial they can be non randomized control trial or they can be quasi experimental study designs per se so let us try to understand with a few examples now for example if you want to compare ultrasonography and urine pregnancy test to diagnose not pregnancy among women with a delay in periods for more than 10 days so that means women are coming to you with a delayed period for more than 10 days and now you are wondering which is better you know is it ultrasound or is it urine pregnancy test which is better to diagnose pregnancy but here you can see that ultrasonography or urine pregnancy is not going to in is not going to affect the outcome that means pregnancy whether it is present or absent is not going to be determined whether you are going to do ultrasonography or urine pregnancy test so this is not an interventional study right so only if you are intervening like many many of the students tend to understand this thing that okay i am intervening i am getting an ultrasound done for this patient so this is an interventional study so no that's not interventional study interventional study is something where your outcome has to get affected so if by that intervention the outcome which is pregnancy present or absent is going to get affected then only you are going to think of that this is an interventional study so don't uh, uh, 
start interpreting RCTs, non-randomized control trial, especially when they are not even interventional studies. So the first rule of the game that we need to all understand is that whether you are going to change the outcome or whether you are not going to change the outcome. If you are going to change the outcome, then this is an interventional study. For example, let me give another example to study the effect of methylprednisolone in COVID-19 associated MISC on mortality. So you know that you are interested in an outcome which is called mortality. The condition or the disease that you are studying is COVID-19 associated uh, missing condition, the intervention that you are giving is methylprednisolone. So methylprednisolone, whether given or not given, is going to definitely affect the mortality, right? So if that intervention is going to affect the outcome, that is the mortality, then only we call this as an interventional study, right? So it's very important to understand and first step of the game that we need to understand is that whether it is actually truly an interventional study or not. Many of the time we start going up uh, aboard and we start saying that, okay, uh, you know, I'm going to randomize one to give ultrasound, another to do urine pregnancy. They start calling it as randomized control trial. So please know, right? It has to be first an interventional study. You should be changing the outcome of the study. Then only this is an interventional study. So the next step called randomized or whether non-randomized, everything will come only when you're doing an interventional study, right? So for example, if I'm comparing methylprednisolone and IVIG in miscon mortality. So again, this is also so interventional study, but I'm comparing two groups. That means one group is methylprednisolone, another group is IVAG. So it is possible that I am giving a standard of care to both the treatment groups and one group is receiving additional methylprednisolone and one group is receiving additional IVAG and then I am seeing whether the outcome that is mortality is getting affected or whether it is not getting affected. So this is again an interventional study. So I wanted to emphasize this very important concept that if by intervention, you are going to change the outcome of that study, right? Then only you call it as an interventional study. Otherwise, do not call it as an interventional study. We know that per se, when it comes to randomized control trials, all these randomized control trials are at the highest level of the hierarchical evidence. And we know that case reports, case series, case control cohort are much below the RCTs. And RCT is one of the most scientifically rigorous method of hypothesis testing. So let us try to now start understanding what do we mean per se by randomized control trial. So the basic structure of randomized control trial is that you have have a population of the interest. From that population of the interest, you are going to choose a sample population. So that means you are taking some kind of inclusion criteria, exclusion criteria, and you're choosing some kind of a sample population. And that sample population is a homogeneous population. And you're randomizing them to receive either of treatment A or treatment B. So that means it's an homogeneous population. One group receives treatment A, another group receives treatment B. So that means whether you receive treatment A or treatment B, it is the same population. So the only thing that is different in treatment A and treatment B is that treatment A group receives treatment A, treatment B groups receive treatment B, otherwise everything is absolutely the same. And then you go on and observe the outcomes as to what are these outcomes. So that means the two treatment group in a randomized control trial are treated identically except for intervention. That means in one of the group you are getting an intervention and another group you might or might not receive an intervention. Now the most important thing that also means that if you are choosing a homogeneous population and you are randomizing them into one of the two treatment groups, RCT is going to obviously balance the baseline characteristics that might confound the outcome. Like one treatment group, you know, it, it just ensures that both the groups are homogeneous, the both the groups are almost the same in the baseline characteristic. This you will remember when you see few RCTs, many of the time you will see that the first table of an RCT says that this is baseline comparison and they don't give you p-value. Obviously, you're not supposed to give p-value because a good, well-designed RCT itself means that the two groups are homogeneous in the population. So ideally, if 
the p value is significantly different between the two groups obviously you are going wrong somewhere in the methodology so it's very important to understand that the baseline characteristics are identical in both the treatment groups so this is an important thing so what are the steps while we conduct a randomized control trial so the first step will be that you identify a good research question arrive at an hypothesis identify what are the outcome variables once a good research question a hypothesis and an outcome variable is decided then you define that what is the target population and how am i going to do the sampling that means how am i going to choose the population from that target population how much will i choose that means how much will be the sample size how will i randomize this group once that the group has been decided i have to randomize into two groups and then how do we do allocation concealment how do we do blinding per se and then once the outcome is analyzed how do we do the data analysis per se do we use an intention to treat for pro protocol analysis or do you use a per protocol analysis that will depend upon what kind of data analysis you are doing so the basic step the first step will be to identify a good research question define the target population decide how much will be the sample size then talk about randomization and then the final analysis so let us start analyzing each and every step one by one the most important thing is the focused research question so let me take an example that if i ask a question that what is the effect of iron supplementation in prevalence of anemia in pregnant women at 32 weeks so if i ask a question that does iron supplementation that means the basic thing that i want to know is that if i give iron supplementation to un uh, you know to pregnant women at 32 weeks how much is going to be the prevalence of anemia so it is very important to ensure that you are identifying and reframing the research question to identify all the components of population intervention outcome as well as the control group so it's very important to understand that whenever you are forming a research question ensure that the population is identified here the population is very clear that it is pregnant women aged 25 to 45 years the intervention is daily iron supplementation but here i did not mention how much of dose you are giving so here now i have mentioned that okay 100 mg of iron supplementation i am giving what is the outcome i want to know prevalence of anemia so that is the outcome and at 32 weeks when compared to control group that means i also need a control group to know whether if i don't give that iron supplementation what will happen to the prevalence of anemia so it's very important to understand that whenever you are forming a research question for a randomized control trial ensure that all the components of population intervention control and outcome are very very clearly defined once this research question is de defined very clearly then we state an hypothesis so let me reaffirm that research question is a question so that means i end it with a question mark so that means i start with a question called what is the effect of daily iron supplementation right but hypothesis is a statement i say that a daily iron supplementation of 100 mg between 8 to 28 weeks of gestation to a pregnant woman aged 25 to 45 year will result in reduction of prevalence of anemia at 32 weeks by at least 10% when compared to the control group so that means i am already making a decision that if there is a group which does not receive iron supplementation if my interventional group is re receiving iron supplementation the difference in the prevalence of anemia should be at least 10% to state that iron supplementation between 8 to 28 weeks of gestation will be useful right so it's very very important to understand that hypothesis is a statement hypothesis is a statement and it also needs an effect size effect size means that i am trying to determine that when will i call intervention to be superior to a control group or for that matter when will i say treatment a will be superior or treatment a will be not inferior to treatment b right so it's very important to understand that the effect size needs to be stated in an hypothesis now the third thing that we need to very clearly define is the outcome variable 
one of the very important thing is that primary outcome variable should be very very clearly defined especially in your rcts what is for example in this in this study i will say prevalence or frequency of anemia at 32 weeks of gestation that will be your primary outcome variable the secondary outcome variables can be you know multiple like for example frequency of clinically significant adverse effect i can say fetal outcome in terms of birth weight i follow up these patients i see how these babies are born so i can you know determine the fetal outcome in terms of birth weight so i can have more number of secondary outcome variables but primary outcome variable needs to be very very clearly defined it should be a very very objective it should be a measurable outcome variable so it's very important to understand that an outcome variable that you are framing should have a quantification that means it should be it should have some kind of a measurability like frequency of anemia i can measure so something which is measurable is a outcome variable so once our research question hypothesis and outcome variables are decided then we start thinking that okay which population do i start studying choosing the right target population is extremely very important because this is going to primarily determine the generalizability of the study what we what do we mean by target population target population is nothing but a population to which it is intended to apply the results so it's important to frame the inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria and it is also important to understand broader is the inclusion criteria better is the homogeneity right but take care of the homogeneity but it is very important that broader is the inclusion criteria better is the external validity of that particular study so it's very important to understand that for example in this study if i say that if i want to test for anemia and i choose only those pregnant women who are you know eating very well who are having only vegetarian diet i am not including non vegetarian diet i am including only those who have a body mass index of so and so so and so that means if you make the criteria very stringent right so once your results are going to come i can apply that result only to that narrow population so it's important to keep the population broad but don't keep it so broad that anybody who is pregnant i'm going to enroll right so that will also make the things uh, a little heterogeneous right so you will have to define very clearly that okay i am going to take somebody who is pregnant between 25 to 45 years who has been diagnosed with pregnancy test and has been has at least undergone you know an ultrasonography so you keep some basic criteria so that you are able to apply apply those results that you are going to come so remember this that at the stage of the protocol itself a lot of mind needs to be applied on how you need to frame the inclusion criteria so keep it a little broad don't keep your inclusion criteria very very narrow because once you keep the inclusion criteria very very narrow it's quite possible that you will not be able to generalize the results per se similarly ensure that exclusion criteria are also framed in such a manner that you don't miss a major chunk but yes important confounding variables you are going to take care to exclude right so how you are going to choose from that target population right among everybody who is coming is what is called as the sampling technique so the sampling technique that means you have a full population that is pregnant women and from that pregnant women how are you going to choose those pregnant women is what is called as a sampling technique and one of the most common sampling technique which usually the clinician uses is a consecutive recruitment it is better to avoid convenience or judgmental sampling convenient sampling means that okay my opd days are on monday and wednesday i am going to take only on my opd days i am not going to take on the other opd days it is quite possible that you know all high risk pregnancies are coming on the other days and nobody is coming to you so it's very very important that don't choose a convenience sampling that anybody who comes to me in my opd days i will recruit that's not the way to recruit it you define an inclusion criteria talk to other consultants of the unit ensure that you know you are putting the inclusion criteria to every consultant that yes if the 
person is fill, fulfilling these inclusion and exclusion criteria, please give me a call. I will come and recruit these patients. So do not choose convenient sampling. And this is one of the biggest errors that usually happen. And this is one of the reasons why many of the you know journals tend to reject your RCTs per se. So these are some of the points that you need to take care at the planning stage itself. Now, the next thing that comes is the sample size. And remember, a very, very important thing is that the sample size calculations are always based on the primary outcome variable, which could be a dichotomous variable or it could be a continuous variable. For instance, prevalence of anemia is, you know, prevalence of anemia is a kind of uh, a variable which is you know dichotomous continuous variable is like you know weight of the baby that has been born is a continuous variable so remember that you can have any kind of a primary outcome you can have continuous variables you can have a dichotomous variable but it is important to understand that sample size calculations are usually mind it usually based on the primary outcome variable so even if you are having multiple secondary outcome variable, it is the primary outcome variable that uh, determines what is the sample size. The next question that comes to everybody's mind is that who decides which is the primary outcome and which is the secondary outcome? It is you who decides what is the prime. So according to you, if as a researcher, I feel that the main purpose is to prevent mortality, right? So my primary outcome will be mortality. But if I am being a pediatrician, if I am involved in this study, I might not be interested in maternal mortality. I might be interested in what is the birth weight of the baby, right? So primary outcome will be determined by the person or the by the researcher who is involved in the study. So nobody usually determines who is the who is going to prime who is going to decide which will be the primary outcome variable but yes primary outcome variables should be something which is something which is you know very clinically very important clinically very relevant choose your primary outcome variable very carefully because your sample size calculations are usually based on that similarly i also told you that effect size that is accepted clinical difference between the two therapies that means group a and group b that a researcher wants to observe in the study for example in this study i told that if i give iron supplementation right if i give iron supplementation to one group and i do not give iron supplementation to another group i will consider the prevalence of anemia to be significant only when there is a difference of more than 10 percent that means at the end of the study i say that you know the prevalence of anemia in the iron supplementation group was 9% and somebody who did not receive iron supplementation was 7%. I will have to say that, sorry, this is the difference between 9 and 7 is only 2%, which is definitely less than the 10% that I have committed. So it's very important to understand that what is the effect size is predetermined before. That means as a researcher, you're already thinking as to what should be the effect size to call it as a significant thing right so similarly type one and most of the time you will realize that effect size is kept as 10 percent difference but yes it will depend upon what kind of clinical difference that you want to consider it as clinically different for instance if um, you know uh, I am dealing with some kind of a rare condition which has a very high mortality. If mortality is going to be reduced even by 2%, I might consider this to be an important. So I can keep my effect size as, you know, uh, 2% also. So it entirely depends upon the clinician and the researcher to decide which will be the effect size. Similarly, what will be the type 1 error? What, uh, usually type 1 error is set at 5% and power of the study can vary from 80% to 90%. But most of the time you will realize the power is usually set at 80 percent but obviously if you increase the power the sample size will automatically increase the next thing that comes to the mind is what is the type of the comparison if you had noticed i have used a word called superiority non-inferiority or an equivalence trial so the only thing that we need to understand is that most of the time the superiority trials are placebo controlled trial that means is it better than not giving treatment at all 
for example as i told you in the depression case that i might give you a standard of the care but i might additionally give some kind of a psychotherapy which i think that if i don't give any therapy this might be better right so remember that superiority trials have a question which is is it better in which experimental treatment is usually superior to the placebo similarly equivalence trials usually state that is it similar enough that means the experimental treatment is equivalent to the active control so it is neither worse nor it is better than the control by greater than a margin that means i am defining a margin to define that it is not worse than this nor it is better than that similarly non inferiority trials are that is it unacceptably worse this is usually a non inferiority trials you will realize that most of the time that we are doing on new drugs are most of the time non inferiority trial in which the experimental treatment is not inferior to the active control that is the standard of the care but remember that non inferiority trials are not very very good to independently show the efficacy right which is much much better elicited by an equivalent study or by a superiority trial now once you have decided that okay what is the research question what is the target population and you have decided what will be your you know type of the study design the next important thing is the process of in informed consent remember that a written informed consent and rather video consent is something which is required and in the video consent many of the time i have seen students you know saying that okay i am going to do this study uh, are you interested are you not interested so you can't ask such type of question on a video consent and many of the time written informed consent is like you know you give a paper to the patient and say hey, sign it here sign it here sign it here tick tick put tick here i will sign i will sign come you also sign here so please ensure that don't do this kind of uh, written informed consent you should ideally provide a consent tell that it is in research we are not very sure what is the purpose of that research there are certain potential benefits there might be some risk that can be associated what will happen if somebody develops some kind of an adverse effect and it is a voluntary participation if you say that no i don't want to participate i am not going to stop your treatment you are most welcome to say bye bye and go at any point of time you can withdraw at any particular stage even after giving treatment you feel that oh this is not my cup of tea you can walk out i won't trouble you i will continue my treatment i won't harm you this is very important to ensure that during your video consent you are covering all these components so routine care will not be affected by refusal to consent this is a very very important thing that oh now you are not refusing me to consent let me see show to some other better doctor so now don't uh, uh, avoid this kind of keeping grudges with you it is a kind of a research ensure that some amount of sanctity is maintained ensure that you are taking a video Uh, of the consent process that is there it should be archived you should always keep a record of it now once you have decided target population is done the next step that comes is randomization now many of the students get confused that what is randomization what is allocation so just to remember that randomization basically refers to a process of assigning the study participant to experimental group or the control group at a random such that each participant has an equal probability of being assigned to any group right mm -hmm. so that means randomization per se is going to ensure that it is going to eliminate the selection bias it is going to balance all the known and unknown confounders and at the same time if you can also do a non random kind of thing in which odd registrations even registration alternate people can be given one treatment a another treatment b another treatment a another treatment b so all these things are non randomized method so randomization per se please understand is a method or the process by which you are assigning the study participant that if a first participant is going to come which treatment i am going to give if the third participant is going to come which treatment will i give so that means randomization is done even before the patient first patient is recruited right so that means i am creating a list of entities in which which person is going to receive which 
treatment is already decided from first to 60. Suppose my sample size is 60. So from the first patient to the 60th patient, I already decide that who is going to receive treatment A, who is going to receive the treatment B. Now, how do we do randomization? There are multiple methods of doing randomization. One of the simple ways using random number table but we generally at this point of era we usually use a website like randomization.com there are multiple websites which can help you but one of the very user friendly uh, website which i have seen is randomization.com but yes simple randomizations are very very useful but very small clinical trials if you're going to do a, a very large clinical trial then simple randomization is good but if you're doing very small trial as a part of your thesis of your student or for that matter if you're doing a very small rct on a small group of patient it's better to use something like block randomization and stratified randomization now what do we per se mean by block randomization now block randomization is that suppose you see this example that means either treatment a or treatment b so if i already decide that i have a block of four that means in my mind, I already know that once an A patient has come, the second patient is also A, the third patient is B. So I even before the fourth patient comes, I already know that the fourth patient is a treatment B, right? If I'm biased towards treatment A, I might say to that treatment B fourth patient that, oh, oh please go home. Um, you go, you are not the right person to come. So another, you know, another very, very thin patient comes, then you think that ah, this can be given B. So come, you are the fourth patient. So that means you have introduced your own bias. That means with this kind of fixed kind of block randomization, you already know in your mind that if somebody has received A, A, B, B, that means block randomization means that at the end of four, I know that equal number of A and equal number of B will be received, right? This is good, but this also has some kind of flaw. So what we use is what is called as a variable block randomization. So in variable block randomization, I don't know whether the block is of two or whether the block is of four. So that means once the patient, first patient is A, the second patient is B, the third patient is A, I cannot be very sure that it will be only B because I don't know what will be the block size of the next patient. So it can be, this is what is called variable size block randomization. And we generally, in most of our thesis, we generally tend to use this kind of block randomization. So if you visit randomization.com, it's a very, very simple thing. You can just write a drug A and drug B. You know that number of subjects that are required per block will be two per, and you need 10 blocks. So you can write the number of subjects per block Block, number of blocks so that means you have a you have chosen the variable sized block so that means one block could be of two another block could be of four another block could be of six you know that the sample size total is 60 right so that means six into five will be 30 four into five will be 20 so this completes my sample size of you know th this is the um, you know, 30, this is 20, so 50 is done. This is 20, so this is 70. So that means if my sample size is 70, I will automatically assign how much, how much, how many subjects will be given per block. So this is what is called, what is called as variable size block randomization. This can be very easily done using randomization.com. And once you generate and click on that button, this is the kind of the list that will be provided that from first patient to the 70 patient, it is already known that who will receive drug A and drug B, right? So if I am the study person, I will not, uh, I will not do it myself, right? So if I do it myself, what I know is that, okay, I know that the first patient will receive treatment B, second is treatment A. So that means already I am biased that I know that so-and-so plan will come, right? So it is better that this randomization is done by your friend who is not involved in the study per se. The other type of so this is what is basically variable size random um, block randomization, which we very commonly use. The second type of randomization is stratified random sampling, which many people use, especially, you know, one of the way to stratify is gender, like, you know, 70 males, 30 females out of 70, ensure that, you know, all males are equally divided. So you, I want, uh, this will be a kind of 
study design in which stratified sample size i want to be very very sure that you know males and females are equally represented i don't want at the end of the study to say that okay 70 are male and 35 are male female so this drug is going to work only in males and not in the female so if you feel as a part of your study you think that there is some kind of a variable which is going to confound majorly you can use a stratified randomization also now how do we randomize how do we do per se there are two major type of study designs that we tend to use one is called as the parallel study design in which the study participants are randomly assigned to either of drug a or drug b and at the end of intervention you are studying the outcome in drug a and outcome in the drug b the other study design which we generally tend to use is crossover study designs in which a person is just a homogeneous study population is divided into drug a and suppose you are doing a placebo kind of a study so at the end of your intervention especially if the drug or you know the intervention is of a rapid onset and a short duration you might have to give a wash out period before you cross over that means you are giving the placebo to that person you are measuring the outcome at the end of drug a at the end of this means so that means outcome in a parallel study design was only once whereas in a crossover study design you are going to study the outcome at two intervals that means one after the drug a was given another after placebo similarly one after the placebo was given another was after the drug a was given so this was all about randomization so if the students should be really very clear that randomization is done even before you are recruiting the first patient so that means at the protocol stage itself if the randomization plan is attached then we know that okay this is a very good plan which is there now what do you mean by allocation concealment now allocation concealment is the purpose of allocation concealment means that it will prevent a selection bias it will protect an assignment sequence before and until the allocation is done so that means if a patient x is randomized to treatment group a this allocation concealment will ensure that he or she gets only treatment a and not treatment b right so that means that if allocation concealment means that if a patient number three has come and by my randomization list the three was supposed to receive drug b so the three should definitely receive drug b and i should not be interfering by saying that please go tomorrow come and by that time i you know take another patient so this allocation concealment is preventing this kind of a bias from the researcher right so one of the two common methods that we tend to use for allocation concealment is what is called sealed envelope technique another is distant randomization distance randomization means that somebody who is sitting in the telephone a researcher who is abroad abroad or for that matter somebody away from your institution is telling you that okay you are third patient has come okay now the third patient should receive drug b so then accordingly you give drug b so that's distance randomization but we generally tend to use sealed envelope technique in which sequentially numbered opaque sealed envelopes are usually used to ensure that you are using opaque envelope so that you are not you know looking under the light and you are able to make out oh this is treatment b let me keep it let me send this patient away let some other patient come so that i give treat so this this is not something intentional what I, I i didn't mean to say that you know it is intentional but many of the time as a researcher you're biased that means suppose you're trying a new treatment you're biased that oh this new treatment is going to be definitely better than the standard treatment so that means there is some kind of bias that the researcher might have so you need to ensure that allocation concealment is done really very very clearly right so it's very very important to ensure that sealed envelope techniques are used to use an opaque envelope the assignments can be placed in advance in a set of envelope by someone not the researcher so that means that you're choosing an envelope that means the randomization list was available so i give this randomization list which was generated by suppose if i am the researcher I, I ask my friend x to prepare this randomization list and i tell this x friend to make you know 60 envelope label this envelope 1 2 3 4 5 6 70 up to 60 one receives drug b drug 
two receives drug A, three receives drug B. So that means within that envelope, I put a slip that says drug A or drug B or drug B, and then I seal it, right? So that means once the third patient is going to come, I will open this third envelope and I will see that, okay, this third envelope has treatment B. So this third patient has to receive treatment B. So this is what is meant primarily by allocation concealment. And this is a common method that we tend to use, which is called as the sealed envelope technique. The third method, which is a third term, which is a little confusing when it comes to RCT is what is called blinding. Blinding basically refers to the practice of, you know, preventing the study participants the investigator and the statistician from knowing who is in the experimental group, who is in the control group, in order to avoid them being influenced by such a kind of a knowledge, right? Single blinded means that the study participant who is getting enrolled into the study does not know whether he is going to receive treatment A or treatment B. If the study participant as well as the researcher does not know whether he is receiving treatment A or treatment B, these are called as double blinded study. But even if the statistician also till the end does not come to know, he just tells that treatment A is superior to treatment B, but he doesn't know which is treatment A, which is treatment B. This is what is called triple blinded study. But yes, Many of the time, all the three are aware. This is what is called open labeled study. Many of the times you tend to use what is called as open labeled study. Suppose you're comparing, you know, a medical treatment from a surgical treatment. How is it possible that even the study participant doesn't know whether I'm eating the medicine or whether I'm going to go to surgery, right? So such kind of comparative studies are usually open labeled. For instance, you're comparing a tablet and a syrup formulation. You can't do a, you know, blinded kind of a study, right? So it's very important to understand that there are certain situations in which blinding cannot be done, right? So in such a cases, you tend to use open labeled kind of a study design. Now. It's very, very important. Another very important thing that I wanted to highlight is that the procedure must be spelled out very, very clearly. So that means standard operating procedures should be very clearly framed. You will have to very clearly define how will the treatment uh, drug A and drug B will be administered to study participant. How are you going to train the part? How are you going to train the researcher? How are you going to ensure that certification is given? A proper checklist is being made. How do you ensure that the person who is, you know, as researcher or for that matter, you know, uh, uh, a person who is doing the study is very qualified to perform this kind of study. Has they been trained how to do randomization, how to do? So everything has to be very, very clearly told in your protocol stage itself that as to how you are going to do it. So standard operating procedure that means once a patient comes, will the, pa will the patient be first administered to your RCT or what will you do first? Right. So that means after reading your protocol, if more questions come, that means your standard operating procedures are not clear. So please ensure that you show your protocol to your friend. And it is always good to show it to your enemy so that he, you know, criticizes that protocol, you know, right and left and say, this is also not done. This is also not done. This is also so pick up all those things and improve your protocol. Ensure that, you know, every component of your, you know, protocol is very, very clearly spelled out. This is a very, very important point because if the standard operating procedure as to how you're going to handle the patient is not clearly spelled out, your RCT is going to get rejected, right? So it's very important to very clearly spell out how you're going to do because this is going to majorly influence your internal validity of the study. As I told you, the inclusion criteria are going to determine your external validity. Your methodology, robust methodology is going to influence your internal validity. So it's very, very important to understand that you 
follow a very very kind of a strict procedure now two or three important things in view of rct that everybody should be aware is that ctra register registry is mandatory for all clinical trials that are conducted in india in 2004 icmge that is international committee of medical journals have very clearly told that if you have not registered i am not going to publish your study so if you have not if your trial is not registered then please don't expect that it will be published in any of the icmg recognized journal so it's very important ensure that a proper institutional ethical committee clearance is very very mandatory ctra registration does not happen without institutional ethical clearance so the first step is always institutional ethical clearance ensure that if you are doing an interventional study a data safety monitoring board should be committed do not keep yourself into that data safety board monitoring keep two or three of your colleagues spell out that so and so person is going to ensure that you know they are that all the patients are safe make create a data safety uh, you know monitoring board especially in all the interventional studies and i just wanted to highlight that ctri uh, from last one or two years have made it mandatory that you have to prospectively registered so if they say that okay i have conducted the study please register my trial they will say sorry you have to look for somebody else ctri now says that at the protocol stage you will have to spell it out very clearly that okay i am doing this study so that whole world knows that yes you are doing this study you are keeping these as your inclusion criteria these as your exclusion criteria you are keeping these as your outcome measures so it's very important to ensure that ctri registration is done ctri is a very professional organization and you will realize that uh that you know the registration is very very fast and i have had a very good experience with ctra registration in all the rcts that till now i have conducted so ctra is a very professional organization so ensure that once your ethical committee is clearance is done ctra should be registered so it's also important to understand that if you are doing a new drug or if you are doing an old drug for a new indication or an old drug by a new route of administration you will require a dcgi approval rather this dictum is usually told by your institutional ethical committee itself the institutional ethical committee says that sorry i cannot give you the ethical clearance you will have to go to dcgi take an approval because it's a new drug once dcgi approves come back to me with that dcgi approval letter then i will think about it so ideally iec clearance should not be given to a trial which is you know involving you know new drugs or a old drug for a new indication or an old drug by a new route of administration so ensure that you know dcg it, it is ultimately let me tell you it is ultimately the research Research liability. So you have to be really very careful when you are doing it. Now, when it comes to handling the data, this is one of the loose area for most of us. That you know, once the study is done, once you know the thesis is completed or the research is completed, you are throwing out all the data. Oh, this paper is published. Now I don't want to keep any case record. So ensure that case record forms are kept safe. Ideally, people say that it should be kept for at least five years after. the you know publication date that has been there generally people also say that more than 20% of follow up losses are very unacceptable so don't expect that you know once the follow up loss is up to 30% somebody is going to say oh please welcome your study is is very robust they might probably just reject the study design you might have to state this as a limitation ensure that whenever a data entry is done two investigators in separate excel sheet is doing it not that you know you are asking your student to uh, you know just record everything and uh, it's done right so just ensure that two investigators and separate excel sheet are doing it compare those excel sheets that you know data entry problems are not happening ensure that the treatment effect this is a very very important concept that i am trying to tell you is the treatment effect that means once your results are out right that means once your results are out i want to now say whether treatment a is better or whether treatment b is better there are two ways to say it right if i state that how likely is it that the result obtained is due to a chance alone 
then you use what is called p value confidence interval right but most of the rcts which are done on a small sample size are more interested in knowing how big is the treatment effect so they are interested in odds ratio they are interested in you know relative risk or rather relative risk reduction so if i just mention the p value the journal will send it back to you stating that what is the magnitude of the treatment effect so please ensure that you commit on magnitude of the treatment effect apart from significance of the treatment effect alone so it is many times important to ensure that magnitude of the treatment effect is also handled along with your significance so many of the time just uh, that treatment a superior to treatment b because the p value is less than 0.05 sorry they say that tell me how superior is you know treatment a as compared to treatment b what is the relative risk of you know treatment giving treatment a versus treatment b so most of the journals are now interested in magnitude of the treatment effect rather than the significance of the treatment effect the other thing that i wanted to also highlight is the basic difference between intention to treat analysis and per protocol analysis now when it comes to intention to treat analysis intention to treat per se means that it ensures that all patients allotted to either of the treatment group or the control group are analyzed together as representing that treatment arm whether they received it or whether they did not receive it whether they completed the study whether they did not completed the study so that means if i recruit 50 patients for iron supplementation 50 for control group my denominator suppose i see that the prevalence of anemia is you know uh, anemia i say that okay 12 of them who received iron supplementation were anemic and those who did not receive were 10 if my denominator is 50 that means 24% and 20% this is what is called intention to treat it is possible that those who received iron supplementation 11 of them ran away right right and in the control group five of them only ran away so when you look at this data that means 12 to 39 this is 30.7% which is definitely much much better than control group this is what is called as per protocol analysis in which only those who have completed the study are included in the denominator right most of the people most of the journals prefer intention to treat analysis because if 11 people have run away from iron supplementation right in this as in this treatment group i know that those 11 people who have run away ran away because it did not improve rather they developed some severe side effect right so most of the journals do not accept a per protocol analysis and they prefer intention to treat analysis so intention to treat per se means that i intended to treat that patient whether he continues that treatment or whether he runs away from that treatment i will consider him to have received that treatment right so this is what is basically meaning of intention to treat analysis but yes many journals do ask you to you know report both intention to treat as well as per protocol analysis especially when the follow up losses are very very minimal but when the follow up losses are very very large they never will usually accept a per protocol analysis now the last part is that once you are completed with your rct you have to appraise your rct so appraising rct is to ensure that the validity of the trial methodology ensure that you know the focus the research question is focused randomization plan what randomization you are going to use is very clearly stated how you are going to do allocation concealment that's very clearly stated the protocol clearly tells you the standard operating procedure you have also clearly stated whether i'm going to do blinding or not how am i going to handle the analysis right am i going to do intention to treat analysis or am i going to use per protocol analysis what is the sample size so that means still your protocol is valid with all these things then we usually do not accept this to be a robust thing so validity of trial methodology is very very important so similarly magnitude and the precision of the treatment effect so 
it's also important to understand as i just told you that it is not only the statistical p value so don't run behind that p value of you know less than 0 0.05 as some magic number right so rather if the treatment effect size is much bigger even if the p value is not significant it might meet some kind of clinical significance so i am trying to re emphasize the fact that it is you know magnitude of the treatment effect that is far more important than just the statistical significance and the last thing that we also look at is applicability of the result to your patient or to the population which will be determined by your external validity and you can very clearly make out from this presentation that is garbage in garbage out you don't prepare a good protocol your study is not going to get published in a good study in a good journal so it's very important to have a very very robust methodology you have to ensure that all steps are done at rct so 90 percent of your you know effort has to go at the protocol stage rather than at a later stage we generally apprise the randomized control trial using a consort study a consort statement we have a checklist so once the manuscript is prepared the manuscript is usually checked with whether they have mentioned all these items or not sample size how sequence was generated how was implemented how blinding was done whether they have written a, st a study flows design or not how was the numbers that were analyzed what wh what were the adverse effect how did they discuss so all these things are basically a consort uh, dr shankar your uh, audio is not your, your voice is not audible I think there is some. No, problem. can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now it's. Oh, I think. Uh, when, uh, since when did you not hear me? Just one or two seconds. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you. So, so just to ensure all that I just mentioned was that consort statement is very, very important to be uh, used. And you often tend to use a study flow to ensure that, you know, study flow is being depicted as to how you randomized, how many allocation, how many followed up, and how many ultimately land up, landed up in analysis. So, this is a kind of study flow which is usually given in the study design. Now, this is with this we reach to an end of rct just one or two slides on what is systematic review and meta-analysis i am probably not the very great expert to understand make you understand systematic review or meta-analysis but systematic review is nothing but it is an objective method of finding an answer to the research question once many people have conducted rcts right so you are always wondering which one will be you know how do we decide whether this treatment a should be given or treatment b should be given so one of the objective way to find answer to such kind of research question is what is called as a systematic review so systematic review basically systematically identifies right selects that means it selects the rcts it evaluates whether this is good, not good, synthesize all the data, right? So it systematically identifies, selects, evaluate, and synthesize all high quality research evidence. And it is nothing but it is just an exhaustive summary on the research question. Most of the time, the panel of experts do an RC uh, systematic review. They not only look at published data, they also look at unpublished data, including those which are, you know, at the levels of you know just abstracts conference proceeding so they also try to contact those authors and try to find out the data from them also so when it comes to meta-analysis meta-analysis is just that once we have you know pulled in the data from multiple studies the meta-analysis is a statistical method to pull the estimates from two or more studies so meta-analysis is a statistical method by which you are telling that treatment a is better than treatment b by what effect right whether treatment a and treatment b which is better we do generally in rct if you want to quantify if you want to tell by a statistical method as to what is the estimate right tell me how how big is the treatment a as compared to treatment b then we 
pool statistically, this is what is called meta-analysis. So that means all statistical systematic reviews per se will have meta-analysis, but ought meta-analysis not all statistical reviews per se will have meta-analysis because it is quite possible that you pulled in many RCTs and you did not get too much of a data to do, you know, meta-analysis. But usually if you're doing a meta-analysis, meta-analysis is usually a part of systematic reviews only per se. So the steps that we generally tend to use in systematic review is that you formulate a research question, you decide that I'm going to choose the study designs, uh, st uh, choose those studies where this is the participant, they have done this intervention, this is the comparative group, this is the outcome that they have seeken. So you make a protocol, you register your systematic review, define your inclusion and exclusion criteria. That means I will choose those studies which have these and these. I will exclude those studies which do not mention so and so, so and so. Similarly, do a literature search and do the study selection look at the quality of the evidence, extract the data, analyze the data, do a meta-analysis, and then generate the level of evidence, and then the results are usually presented in a systematic review. So meta-analysis is nothing but it is an objective and a valid method of analyzing and combining those results. So it has a very good diagnostic and therapeutic value, which is usually used for what is called evidence-based treatment. Many of the times you would have, you know, realized that you you know, what is the evidence that, you know, treatment A is better than treatment B? Such kind of answers are usually generated from meta-analysis. So, but yes, conclusions provided are far more statistically stronger than the result of a single study. And we can see that above RCT, you have systematic reviews and meta-analysis. So at the level of hierarchy, the systematic reviews and meta-analysis of RC, matlab, systematic reviews of RCTs are at a much higher level level. So with this, I almost come to the end of this presentation to summarize that a well-designed methodologically sound RCT evaluating an intervention provides a strong evidence of cause effect relation. CTRI registration, please remember, DCGI ethical approvals are mandatory. Hope at the end of this presentation, at least the students who are listening, who are youngsters are listening, should be clear on what is randomization, what is allocation concealment, and what is blinding. And we often tend to use consort statement and checklist while we are reporting an RCT. Hope I have provided some amount of justice, if not too much to the objectives that I started with. Thank you very much. And I thank once again, Dr. Nitin and uh, the MET division of RML Institute for providing this opportunity. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Dr. Shankar. I think it, uh, in whatever lectures I have ever heard on RCT, this is one of the best, absolutely simple. And all the terms which we often come across as faculty or if those graduates who are doing their studies, they come across. I think all the terms have been explained beautifully. So uh, just one or two questions I have for you, Dr. Shkoshik, is that uh, you, yeah. this trial registry is must now. Oh, the trial registry is a yes. must now. Now, uh, there is a problem which yes, we yes. face uh, because in most of the theses, uh, especially in certain departments, they compare one procedure to the other, uh, especially when they are giving thesis topics to their postgraduate students. Now, uh, often when they come to the institutional review board or to the ethics committee, they often give this uh, you know, justification that, no, no, these two procedures are very well done in literature. It is just that we are trying to compare the two. So it is th this does not become a randomized control trial. And most of the times, you know, I have seen in certain IRBs and ethical committees, this is being passed as a randomized control study, not a trial. So firstly, uh, firstly, that I think this should be called a trial because though there are two different uh, methods which are being used, though they might be existing in literature, because most of the time researchers say, no, this is not new. That is why it is not a trial. It should be called a study. So is this a valid justification which they give or is it not a valid justification? 
Uh, yes, thank you for this interesting question, Nitin. But uh, what I wanted to, uh, that's why I started my presentation from the first thing by stating that what is an interventional study, right? Many of the people consider diagnostic accuracy studies. That means where you are comparing two investigations for establishing a diagnosis to be a randomized control trial. So first step is whether this study is an interventional study or not. Right. So if the intervention, that means suppose they are comparing two, you know, diagnostic method, if that's not going to change the outcome of the study, this is not an interventional study. So please do not use terms like RCT, quasi random and so first step is whether it is interventional study or not. So you need to identify that only because you have one intervention, another comparator does not mean that it is an, you know, RCT. If you're comparing treatment A, you know, diagnostic one from diagnostic two does not mean that it is an RCT. So the only thing that I wanted to emphasize as a simple rule is that if your intervention is going to change the outcome, then only call it as an interventional study. Otherwise, don't even call it as interventional study. And this is the reason why I started my presentation by stating that don't label diagnostic accuracy studies as you know, RCTs. If you're not changing the outcome of the patient, do not call them as randomized control trials. Now, suppose if there are two surgical procedures which are being done, surgical procedure A or surgical procedure B. Now, both these procedures are very well there in the literature. Some work has been done on procedure A also and procedure B also. Now, a researcher wants to compare the two procedures. And the researcher says that, okay, I want to do this. I want to uh, compare both the both of them. And I want to see the effect, like suppose, uh, okay, maybe it is that time to heal or maybe any other outcome which they decide. So uh, does this become a randomized control study or a trial? Okay, now let me, uh, thank you. I understood your question. So the basic thing is that if the population is homogeneous, that means if they are choosing one homogeneous population, suppose they say that I'm going to, you know, choose some elderly patients who are presenting. I'm just giving an example. I'm not a surgeon, so I might give a very lame example, but uh, I'm just trying to say that you are taking an old person and you are, you know, having a mass in the abdomen and I want to, uh, or for that matter, you say that uh, appendicitis patient has come to me all patients are there. If a homogeneous population is coming and then you are randomly dividing them into one of the true surgical treatment, then this will be definitely an interventional study, right? So especially the outcome is going to change from your intervention, whether you're going to do surgical procedure A or surgical procedure B. The next question that comes is that should I give ethical clearance or not? It is totally up to the domain of the ethical committee people, whether they consider this as a good uh, study or not, right? Suppose if the, uh, generally speaking, if you are doing procedure one and procedure two and procedure two is a standard of care and it has produced very good results, then why, why do you need to compare this with a standard of care, which is already providing a good study result. So many of the ethical committee people say that if you know standard of care is itself working so well, why are you doing a study on comparing another surgical procedure? So it entirely depends upon um, what is already known, known in the literature. So it is the author who has to give that justification hmm. or the researcher who has to give that justification. So unless and until they are randomizing, we cannot call it as a randomized control study or a trial. So if they are just recruit, you know, comparing one procedure with the other, they have not randomized the patient. It was the surgeon's prerogative Correct. that okay, it's a, this is group A. I am treating this X person with in with plan A and this Y person with plan B. Then it is not a RCT. Then it is just a comparative study which so they I are can... doing. No, 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 you can, you need, it is still an interventional study, right? So you can call them as quasi experimental quasi studies. studies. Exactly. Right. So you need not call it as a randomized control trial so because you did not create. Study. Yeah. You did not create a randomization list, right? You did not create a randomization list at the initial stage that the second patient of appendicitis will go only this 
will undergo this procedure only so if you have not done this procedure this is not rct many of the time you will realize that most of the surgeons they generally tend to do quasi experimental quasi -experimental, study exactly. and uh, right. the, so it's the, not the, a bad study ha so the, but it's does, not a bad study because ha, yeah, but yeah, does sorry. but does quasi experimental need to be registered with ctri uh the answer is very simple yes okay so even that right. has to be any ready. any ideally speaking any interventional study has to be, be, has to be registered has to be right registered. so it is always better to be registered than not registered because if you have not registered you have lost the opportunity, opportunity. tomorrow the journal says that no this is not a uh, you know quasi experimental you have done a very good study i am interested in publishing please tell me the registration <laughs> id you hmm. can't go back to find out registration id ctri will will say that please sorry bye bye you don't uh, you can't do anything about it now so it's always better to register than not to register okay at time ctri people who are sitting are very very good they can take a decision that okay you need not register on this but make an attempt and register ah, exactly. and one last question is that data safety monitoring board so uh, how do you form it you said you can take three friends or they can form a data safety monitoring board but are there any other guidelines for forming a dsmb or it is up to uh, the prerogative of the investigator no, that no. he decides how to form a, a data safety monitoring board not at all it should never be a prerogative of investigator then in that case if i am doing i will call my two three friends and then they will say that okay this will be data safety board so that's not a data safety board so it is the ethical committee's prerogative to decide who will be the data safety data board safety. members right so i most of the time you will realize that data safety board member one of them is from your own specialty you can't mm -hmm. do an data safety board of an obstetric person if an obstetric trial is happening as a pediatrician i might not be you know able mm -hmm. to understand anything so most of the time you will realize that institutional ethical committee appoints somebody from ops gynae whether he is a friend or enemy that i don't know ah, so but it is not the investigator who does it right it has to be by the ethical committee correct 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 so uh, with this i thank dr jay shankar koshik mm -hmm. for a wonderful talk he has given on randomized control trials and i think he has simplified it just the way he has simplified pediatric neurology in his book clinical approach to pediatric neurology for post graduate students and practicing pediatricians so uh, thank you dr jay shankar koshik for a wonderful talk Thank you so much, Dr. Nitin, and thank you, RML Institute. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.